Shakti Pods here too. Okay, so I don't know if you guys are aware of this thing or not. Um, it's called the Heliodorus Pillar. It's a stone column which was erected around 110 BCE in central India, in Madhya Pradesh, India, by a Greek ambassador uh, of the Indo-Greek king Antiak, uh, Antial. Kiras, Antialchidas, or whatever his name is, around that era. As some of you may know, uh, the Greeks during about that time period had, had extended their empire, thanks to Alexander the Great, all the way from India to Egypt to Greece. So this was during the Hellenistic period when they 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 had expanded all over these places. They had, you know, they had kings and and uh, kingdoms set up in all different places in Phoenicia, Syria, um, in in you know. As far away as far as way as as Pakistan, as far away as Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, they were having an empire. So this pillar is a very interesting piece in and of itself. Just by just it existing is is freaking amazing. It's a Greek Vaishnav. If you scroll down and you read about this, uh, there's there's an inscription on the pillar, and the inscription says. Deva Devasa Vasudevasa Garuda Bhajo Adyam. I'll just read it in English. This Garuda standard of Vasudev, the god of gods, was erected here by the devotee Heliodorus, the son of Dion, a man of Takshila, which was a region in, of the Greco uh, in uh, the Greco Indian Empire near Bactria or, or, or what we now know as Pakistan. The son of Dion, a man of Takshila, sent by the great Greek king Antiochidas as ambassador to King Kashiputra Bhagavadra, the savior son of the princess from Benares, in the 14th year of his reign. So, although not perfectly clear, the inscription seems to refer to Heliodorus as a Bhagavata, a devotee of Bhagavan, a devotee of the Lord. Therefore, in Hinduism, he would be a Vaishnav. And since he addresses him specifically as Vasudev, Vasudev is a name of Krishna. This is this is a temple, this is a pillar to Krishna by a Greek king, or a Greek ambassador, excuse me, to a Greek king named Heliodorus. And you know, Bhakti Ananda Goswami makes an interesting case about Heli, which was of course the ancient Helios being the ancient sun god, the solar god of the of the of the Greek area. Helios uh, has some reference to the name Hari, you know, and, and he makes the case that these are all linked together and, and it's very interesting. But either way. So I was reading about this, you know, for, for some reason something had brought me to this this page again. I'd already known about it. But for some reason this time when I read it, I went to the bottom of the page and I found this part. It says, based on this evidence, it has been suggested that Heliodorus is the earliest Westerner on record to convert to Vaishnavism. But some scholars, most notably A.L. Basham and Thomas Hopkins, are in the opinion that Heliodorus was not the only Greek to convert to Bhagavat Krishnaism. And if you look up what Krishnaism is, you'll find that Gaudiya Vaishnavism was not the beginning of Krishna-centric Vaishnavism. This was actually around for a long time before this. So, he was not the only Greek to convert to Bhagavata Krishnaism, that is Krishna-centric Vaishnavism, Vaishnavism. Hopkins, chairman of the Department of Religious Studies at Franklin and Marshall College, has said Heliodorus was presumably not the only foreigner who was converted to Vaishnav devotional practices, although he might have been the only one to erect a column, at least uh, one that is still extant. Certainly there must have been many others. That's not the crazy thing though. Here it goes on to say, the second book of Maccabees includes a description of the form of God that is strikingly similar to the depictions of Krishna and Balaram in Vaishnavism. In Vaishnavism, Krishna and Balaram are characterized as youthful, resplendently dressed and very handsome young men. And I would add, they're also kicking ass and defending their devotees and all this stuff. The depiction matches the description of God as he appeared to Heliodorus in the temple of Jerusalem, 
according to the record of 2nd Maccabees. So this is a canonical Catholic scripture, Catholic and Greek Orthodox scripture. This is a canonical scripture from, from the uh, biblical time when, when Catholic and Greek Orthodox was, was the predominating um, religions. This is a canonical scripture. This is a part of the Bible. Mac 2 Maccabees is a part of the official Bible. And it says this, Then two other young men, remarkably strong, strikingly beautiful, and splendidly attired, appeared before him, standing on each side. They flogged him unceasingly until they had given him innumerable blows. So what this is, this is a manifestation of the Lord in the form of two resplendently dressed young men who are defending his devotee. Heliodorus, who later becomes a Vaishnav, a Krishna-centric Vaishnav. So the Lord is making a manifestation of two resplendently beautiful young men before Heliodorus. And after this story, which happens in the Bible, he ends up going to India and erecting this, this pillar. So I'm going to read to you the full part of 2 Maccabees chapter 3 from the Bible um, so you can understand uh, the story and how amazing that this is. Beginning with verse 1. 2 Maccabees chapter 3 verse 1. While the holy city was inhabited in unbroken peace, and the laws were very well observed because of the piety of the high priest Onias and his hatred of wickedness, it came about that the kings themselves honored the place and glorified the temple with its finest pres with the finest presence. Talking about the temp the, the great temple of New of Jerusalem of the Jews. So this is what we're talking about the great temple of the Jews, so that even Seleucus the king of Asia defrayed from his own revenues all the expenses connected with the service of the sacrifices. So he's saying that in this in this period um, of, of Judaic history, which is recorded in this part of the Bible, this great high priest Onias was rule was uh, not ruling, but was keeping everything in wonderfully order. He was keeping everything perfect because of his piety and because of his staunch hatred of wickedness. So all of the kings from the surrounding areas were giving them tribute and paying for the sacrifices. Everything was going perfectly according to the Vedic Dharma. But a man named Simon of the tribe of Benjamin, who had been made captain of the temple, had a disagreement with the high priest about the administration of the city market. And when he could not prevail over Onias, he went to Apollonius of Tarsus, who at that time governed Cola, Syria, and Phoenicia. So this is Apollonius of Tarsus is a Greek governor of the area where Jerusalem and, and Judea is. This is after Alexander the Great had already run through and established all these, these Greek kingdoms around uh, the, the first century BC. So, he went to Apollonius of Tarsus, who at the time governed Cola, Syria, and Phoenicia. He reported to this king that the treasury in Jerusalem was full of untold sums of money, so that uh, the amounts of the funds could not be reckoned, and they did not belong to the account of the sacrifices, and that it was possible for them to fall under the control of the king. So he's saying, oh, look at uh, these Jews over here. He had a disagreement with Onias, so he says, look at these Jews over here. They're sitting on all this gold and they're pretending like it's for sacrifices, but they don't really, they don't really need it. You can go and get that. So Heli, uh, when Apollonius met the king, uh, he he told him about the money, uh, which he had been informed. The king chose Heliodorus, who was in charge of his affairs. Heliodorus. It says as in the Bible, his name is Heliodorus. It says in the Bible directly, and this is the exact same time period when the the pillar was erected. The king chose Heliodorus, who was in charge of his affairs, and sent him with commands to effect the removal of the aforesaid money. Heliodorus at once set out for the journey, ostensibly to make a tour of inspection of the cities of Colossaria and Phoenicia, but in fact to carry out the king's purpose. When he had arrived in Jerusalem and had been kindly welcomed by the high priest of the city, he told him about the disclosure that he had been made and stated why he had come and inquired whether this was really the situation. The high priest explained that there were some deposits belonging to widows and orphans, and also some money of 
Hyrakinus, son of Tobias, a man of very preeminent, preeminent position, and that it totaled about all about 400 talents of silver and 200 of gold. To such an extent, the impious Simon had misrepresented the facts. And he said that it was utterly impossible that wrong should be done to those people who had trusted in the holiness of the place and in the sanctity and inviolability of the temple which is honored throughout the whole world. So he's saying, look, all the people, they, if you, he, 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 as a priest, he's saying, look, you're going to shake all the people's faith. You're going to shake the structures of our whole society. Everything is just going so good. We're, you know, being faithful. We're, we're, we're doing the sacrifices to the Lord. Everybody's being very pious. And here, this thing is going to come in and, and ruin everything. So he, he's saying, please, you, you can't do this. He's, he's begging the Greek ambassador, please don't do this. But Heliodorus, because of the king's command, which he had, said that it's money that this money must in any case be confiscated for the king's treasury. Well, that's how it was back then. So he set a day and went into the direct expansion of these funds. There was no little distress throughout the whole city. The priests prostrated themselves before the altar in their priestly garments and called towards heaven upon him who had given the law about deposits that he should keep them safe for those who had deposited them. To see the appearance of the high priest was to be wounded at heart, for his face and the change in his color disclosed the anguish of his soul. For terror and bodily trembling had come over the man, which plainly showed to those who looked at him the pain lodged in his heart. People also hurried out of their houses in crowds to make a general supplication before the holy place was about to be brought into contempt. Women girded with sackcloth under their breasts thronged the streets. Some of the maidens who were kept indoors ran together to the gates and some to the walls while others peered out of windows. And holding up their hands to heaven, they all made entreaty. There is something pitiable in the prostration of the whole populace and the anxiety of the high priest in his great anguish, while they were calling upon the Almighty Lord that he would keep what had been entrusted safe and secure for those who had entrusted it. Heliodorus went on with what had been decided. But when he arrived at the treasury with his bodyguard, then and there, the sovereign of spirits and of all authority caused so great a manifestation that all who had been so bold as to accompany him were astounded by the power of God and became faint with terror. For there appeared to them a magnificently uh, caparisoned horse. It means a horse that's decked out all the beautiful fineries and the, the capes and everything with a rider of frightening mind. And it rushed furiously at Heliodorus and struck him with its front hoofs. Its rider was seen to have armor and weapons of gold. Two young men also appeared to him, remarkably strong, gloriously beautiful, and splendidly dressed, who stood on each side of him and scourged him continuously, inflicting many blows on him. When he suddenly fell to the ground and deep darkness came over him, his men took him up and put him on a stretcher and carried him away. This man who had just entered the, entered the aforesaid treasury with great retinue and all his bodyguards, but was now unable to help himself. And they recognized clearly the sovereign power of God. While he lay prostrate speechless because of the divine intervention and deprived of any hope of recovery, they praised the Lord who had acted marvelously for his own place. And the temple which, a little while after, was full of fear and disturbance, was filled with joy and gladness, gladness, now that the Almighty Lord had appeared. It says this, literally, the Almighty Lord had appeared in this manifestation of two young men who came and protected their devotees and upheld the Vedic Dharma and the sacrifices and the righteousness and the piety of Jerusalem and upheld the righteousness of their own house, the Holy Jerusalem Temple. They praised the Lord who acted marvelously for His own place. And the temple, which was a little while before was filled with fear and disturbance, was filled with the great joy and gladness, now that the Almighty Lord had appeared. Quickly, some of Heliodorus' friends asked Onias to call upon the Most High and to grant life to one who was lying quite at his last breath. 
and the high priest, fearing that the king might get the notion that some foul play had been perpetrated by the Jews with regard to Heliodorus, offered sacrifice for the man's recovery. While the high priest was making the offering of atonement, the same young man, the same young men appeared again to Heliodorus, dressed in the same clothing. And they stood and said, Be grateful to Onias the high priest, since for his sake the Lord has granted you your life. And see that you, who have been scourged by heaven, report to all men the majestic power of God. Having said this, they vanished. Then Heliodorus offered sacrifice to the Lord and made very great vows to the Savior of his life. And having bid Onias farewell, he marched off with his forces to the king. And he bore testimony to all men of the deeds of the Supreme God, which he had seen with his own eyes. When the king asked Heliodorus what sort of person would be suitable to send on another mission to Jerusalem, he replied, If you have any enemy or plotter against your government, send him there, for you will get him back thoroughly scourged if he escapes at all. For there certainly is about the place some power of God, for he who is dwelling in heaven watches over that place himself and brings it aid. And, and he strikes and destroys those who come to do it injury. He, personally. So here you have a personal God in Judaism. Not, not, a, not a distant, formless, miasmic blob. Not an unspeakable name that can never be known or pronounced. Here you have an imminent, personal God who appears, appears plainly and defends righteousness. Upholds Dharma, as it says in the Bhagavad Gita. So, this two Maccabees is a deuteronomical, is a deuter-canonical book of the Bible. This is a canonical biblical text. And it says it was probably written in Koine Greek, probably in Alexandria, Egypt, circa 124 BC. Circa 124 BC. And if we look to when the Heliodorus pillar was erected, 110 BC. BC. 14 years later. So we see. Okay, so this 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 Heliodorus pillar was erected by a Greek ambassador, Heliodorus, who was a fervent convert to Vaishnavism, specifically to Krishna-centric Vaishnavism, who just happened to be a Greek ambassador, some kind of high, you know, public ambassador emissary role like he was playing before in his uh, in his in his job when he went to the Jerusalem temple to try to get the money he was playing in the same role as an ambassador he obviously had he 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 requested somehow to be switched by his king to become a greek ambassador to the indo king to india so he must have heard from somebody in that area that the form of the lord which he had perceived some of the greeks i'm sure some of the greeks phoenicians some of the people in that area must have known about radha krishna and balaram krishna and all this so he he, he beseeched his, his administrators, his kings or whatnot, to allow him to, to, to switch positions so that he got to go to India. So then in 14 years later, we see that he is a Greek ambassador to the king Antiochides. He's trying to, he's erecting this pillar and he's trying to raise interest in this religion. He's trying to raise converts. He's trying to, to broadcast, he's trying to preach it in his official capacity. He was trying to create some kind of movement or revolution even. But that's besides the point. It's just so amazing. There you have him 14 years later. This is the same Heliodorus. I refuse to believe in coincidences. This is the same Heliodorus. So the Balaram Krishna that appeared was obviously related to the, the Kurukshetra War, which had only happened several thousands of years earlier. His Leela in Dwarka and Kurukshetra had only happened so many years before that he came again to the West in his same capacity, displaying his strength 
and opulence and his favor for the devotees. All of this which you hear in Vedic Dharma. So if the Lord of the Temple of Jerusalem appeared as Balaram Krishna, what does that mean for us? There are those that say that Jesus, whose name was Isha, Isa, he's known by Is, Isa to the Muslims, was Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is Lord Balaram. One of the names of Lord Shiva is Isha. Yeshua, Isha. Bhakti and Nanda Goswami Maharaj, who has a wonderful you know, website, who I've been working with on his videos and whatnot, he upholds all of these truths. He is working hard, relentlessly, to prove all of this and to preach this Hellenistic Vaishnavism. If I would like to call it anything, Hellenistic Vaishnavism, Hellenistic Krishnaism even which he says is the center of the Greco-Judaic, Catholic, Indian, Buddhist, it doesn't matter, all of them, he says, are essentially Vaishnav lineages. So in this, we have Jesus, Isha, the son, Shiva, Balram, appearing, the son part of the Trinity, appearing, uh, uh, Bhakti Ananda Goswami, uses the trinity of, of Krishna, Balaram, and Paramatma for the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And he says that Balaram is the son. And what was, what was Jesus? Jesus said he was the son of the Lord, the servitor God, reaching out to the West with his causeless mercy to bring the conditioned souls back home. He also said that nobody gets to the Father but through me. This is the same claim made by Lord Nityananda when he appeared in Gauralila. And all Gaudiya Vaishnavas know this, that you cannot get the mercy of Lord Gaura, you cannot get the mercy of Lord Krishna without Nityananda. There's no getting the mercy of Chaitanya without Nityananda. So this is the same principle that Jesus exemplified. He said, there's no getting the mercy of the Father without me. Maha Shankarshan and the portal between the infinite and the finite.